the opportunity to uh, uh, have this uh, this conversation, this presentation with everyone. I wanted to thank uh, uh, the Shimong Chamber of Commerce and uh, Kamala and uh, Emily, of course, and also the Olean Chamber of Commerce and Mimi, who we've worked with uh, both organizations for many, many years. And uh, we were talking uh, on the in the pre the pre talk a little bit about collaboration. And you know this uh, webinar is a, a great example of, of collaboration between chambers and in different uh, communities. But uh, we're all <laughs> truly in this together, so this is an opportunity to reach out to a little bit wider audience. Um, so uh, with that, uh, very briefly about Data Branch. Uh, Data Branch is a uh, information technology uh, solutions provider, managed services provider. Uh, we've been in business since 1985, which in computer years is a, a fairly long time. Uh, we're headquartered in Olean, New York, but uh, we cover a pretty big geography. And uh, we serve clients uh, throughout central and western New York, northwestern PA, um, as well as uh, internationally. Um, and uh, we specialize in, in a, a number of areas uh, regarding technology. Uh, but uh, particularly have a, a focus in uh, security and data protection, um, and uh, I guess now in, in collaboration. Um, and uh, our presenters today primarily are going to be our CTO, Chief Technical Officer, Mike Wilson. And Mike has been uh, working in IT for over 20 years. Uh, he worked uh, with Data Branch when he first started his career, and then uh, many years in the healthcare uh, industry, and we're we're delighted to have him back as part of the team. And uh, Amanda Lasky, who's our director of sales and marketing, uh, Amanda is a graduate of uh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, as well as an MBA from St. Bonaventure University, and uh, both of them are are terrific members of the team and and have a lot to share. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to them and uh, get started. Thanks, David. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, like Dave said, Mike Wilson, Chief Technical Officer at Data Branch. Been with uh, Data Branch for the past year. Uh, as Dave said, I've been in IT for two decades, working with clients of, of all sizes and uh, many different verticals. Healthcare um, was a, a big part of my IT career, and uh, look forward to the discussion today. Yep. And good morning, everyone. I'm Amanda Lasky, our Director of Sales and Marketing here. Um, I've been with Data Branch my entire professional career and really love getting to help the businesses in our local community find the right technology solutions to grow their business and protect their critical data and solve challenges. And one of the biggest challenges we're all going to be facing over the next few weeks is how are we going to reopen our businesses and adjust to this new normal. And I look forward to our discussion today and the role that technology is going to play in that transition. So, I went one too far. So, in early March, as we all know, our world changed. We had to band together, stay home, work from home, and do our part to really reduce the spread of COVID 19. And the good news for many of us on this call is that we're in those southern tier and western New York regions, and we've met all seven of New York State's metrics for reopening and are currently in that phase one, expected to hopefully move into phase two next week without any further setback. So what does this mean for all of us as business owners and organization leaders? You know, some of you may have already started this process under phase one at Data Branch. We work with a lot of construction and manufacturing customers for their technology needs, and they've already started down that path to reopening. And then most of us in the professional services, finance, insurance, retail space will be joining them shortly. Overall, we know that the shape and form of back to work is starting to emerge and utilizing your organization's business technology is going to be critical to facilitating a smooth transition back to the workplace. As all of us throughout New York, Pennsylvania and our country begin to gradually reopen and ramp up our businesses over time. So just to review our agenda this morning, we're going to be looking at three key questions. 
first, you know, what aspects of my business are going to remain remote and how can I make sure that my technology is going to support those remote workers over the long term? So number two, how are our businesses in general going to reopen gradually and ramp up over time? And then how will we have to look at using our technology differently moving forward when we return to the workplace? And we've also seen a lot of different security challenges arise due to COVID-19. So we're going to share some of our best tips to help keep your organizations protected from cyber criminals. As Emily mentioned, we are going to have time for questions at the end. So I would encourage you to just put them in the chat throughout this webinar. And if we don't end up getting to your question due to time constraints, you know, I'll make sure to reach out to anyone who has a question personally to make sure it gets answered for you. So we know that not everyone is going to go back to the office as we all transition. Many businesses may decide to have some of their workers remain as remote workers. And there are going to be positives to be drawn from this new normal, but also considerations that each business is going to have to carefully look at and decide how they want to handle them. And some of the positives of working from home long term are flexibility for your staff you know, their location, their hours. A lot of businesses can also see cost savings if they're able to reduce their office space or even eliminate their office space by moving completely remote. And then we've also consistently been seeing reports that have been coming out recently that show that many people have shared that they really like working from home. There's no commute, they have more flexibility. But the reality is we, there are considerations that we have to look at too. Like how are you going to measure productivity for your remote employees? You know, do you have a company policy that specifies your do's and don'ts of working from home? And is the technology your employees are using at home, you know, up to par from a security perspective and from a productivity perspective? Before the pandemic, only about 7% of civilian workers in the U.S. had access to a flexible workplace benefit, or telework. And that's according to the 2019 National Compensation Survey from the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics. And this implies that many businesses didn't have formal policies with expectations for working from home when everyone suddenly became teleworkers overnight. And this is something that all organizations should implement if their workers are going to be staying home long term. So some key items to make sure you include as you're developing your work from home policy is where is it acceptable to work? You know, is it truly okay for your workers to work from anywhere, like the man on the laptop at the beach? Or would it be better for them to have a more traditional at home office setup? You know, if someone hears your employee talking business in a coffee shop, could they hear confidential information? You know, are there concerns about sensitive <clears throat> info that might be displayed on their screens? Or will their technology be set up to mitigate the security concerns that come from using public Wi-Fi? You know, who's eligible to work from home? You know, some roles in your company, they may have been able to get by working from home over the past two months. But are there roles where it's optimal to still have your employee in the office? That would need to be defined in your policy. And then how's your business going to measure productivity? Many companies have been looser with their expectations on remote workers over the past two months. But if this is going to remain a long-term working solution, you're going to have to look at what your key performance indicators are for each role that's going to remain remote and how you're going to measure and monitor them remotely for each team member moving forward. And if these measures are new or these are different indicators, you need to clearly state them and review with each worker who's going to be remaining remote. From an attendance and availability perspective, you know, do your workers have to check in at certain times or are there time periods where they need to be available to members who are still remaining in the office? You know, here at Data Branch, we've been heavily utilizing Microsoft Teams to communicate and collaborate with one another. And each of our teams has a daily morning video call that everyone is expected to attend, whether they're in the office or at home. And we have set expectations for responding to chats within a set time period and always having your video camera on when you're talking with your team members. 
And then how will your employees communicate and collaborate with one another? Our top three tips for strong communication between employees that are at home and employees that are in the office are to number one, encourage your remote staff to always ask themselves, you know, what do I know? Who else needs to know? Have I told them when it comes to communication? Number two, encourage your remote staff to over communicate. You know, it's better for colleagues to be told something twice than not at all. And then always ask your team to take the attitude of assume positive intent when dealing with communication from coworkers. You know, I think we've all been on the side of an email or text that read negatively because it was lacking those cues we get from people's facial expressions or their body language when we're able to meet with them face to face in person. So assuming the best of each other can really help both remote and office employees overcome that hurdle. And then how will your remote users access IT support? You know, who will be managing technology that's now located at someone's home? Is your internal IT responsible for managing a home network? Do you need to review your agreement with your IT managed services provider to ensure that these home devices are covered under your current contract? You know, whichever direction you take, having the path documented and clearly stated for remote employees is key. So proper equipment to work from home. Um, I like this slide because it applies to not just working from home, but pretty much any of our IT infrastructure or any of our devices. Um, I'll start with, do you know what equipment your employees are using at home? Do you know what's on those devices? So when the stay at home orders were executed in March, everything was moving quickly. The reality is that some businesses were positioned better than others to support the work from home you know, uh, transition. They may have already had infrastructure and devices that allowed them to just pick up and move, like laptops or you know, cloud applications, secure VPN setup, or like a Citrix environment. But others had to scramble. So some people moved desktop devices to their home. They packed up and, and moved everything. Do you know what went home, if anything? <clears throat> some purchased laptops quickly, which was great, but unfortunately, the impact on the supply chain became very real, and lead times to get devices um, became weeks or even months. This led to businesses buying whatever they could from Amazon or Walmart or even Staples. Um, and then personal and home devices were being used. So shared, shared family computers that we don't really have any visibility into and we don't know what the security posture of those devices are. So all this led to our organization's networks being more vulnerable. Businesses were forced to make a decision to get users home, keep them working. So we heard phrases like, we can circle back on security once things settle down, or we just need to get people working. So not surprisingly, we've seen a huge increase in attacks directly related to work from home. Bad actors took advantage of these circumstances. They knew security practices were likely sacrificed, and they tried to capitalize on them. So with the rise in COVID-related security threats and the strong likelihood of managing a workforce that's not only remote, but also in-house, the time is now to round back on those. So for any employees who will continue to work from home, we recommend an audit of the technology that they're using to ensure that it's appropriate, it's secure, and it's sufficient to enable optimal productivity. Some questions you might not have thought to ask, you know, do they have the same amount of screens at work versus at home so they can continue to be productive? Do they have sufficient internet access at home? Not everybody has broadband or has the availability to get broadband. Um, should you provide a docking station so that they can seamlessly transition from the office to the home? Um, ultimately, it's what do your users need to do their jobs effectively? Uh, phone systems, are you able to take your phones uh, home? Some companies were able to have their employees take their phones home, plug them in, and continue business as usual. But we've seen an increase in employees giving out their personal cell phone numbers. So what are the implications for your company's standard operating procedures, or what happens if an employee leaves and they aren't using a company-owned cell phone, and their personal number is what your client knows? And then how will you deploy your security stack to these devices? Has it already been deployed to these devices? Having an IT asset management system is a vital component to maintaining visibility and security of your devices. So continuing on securing of the devices theme, 
we've probably all heard of multi-factor authentication, MFA or 2FA. So what is that? Um, MFA is an authentication method which a user is granted access after presenting two or more pieces of evidence or factors. So for example, a password and then a time-based security code using an authenticator like Google Auth on our cell phones. The moral of the, of the story for this one is that passwords are simply just not enough anymore. No matter how strong they are, passwords get stolen too frequently. Social engineering and phishing emails can be very convincing. The bad guys are very good at tricking people into exposing their credentials. That, that, that's their job. That's what they do. They're, they're extremely effective at it, and it can be extremely lucrative. So MFA can help reduce this drastically. Microsoft even reports that 99.9% .9 of Office 365 account compromises could be or could have been blocked by using multi-factor authentication. So this slide, we've got a couple pictures of, of you know, multi-factor authentication and how, it, um, how we can accomplish that. Um, authenticator applications on cell phones, such as Duo or Google Auth, or a hardware token that you would need to have a manual button press to, have your, to be your second factor. So MFA is truly one of the best bang for your buck security measures you can take relatively quickly and DevRanch can guide you on the best form for your organization. Many applications even have 2FA built in, such as Office 365. All we have to do is enable them and train our employees and our users on those changes. So if multi-factor authentication is natively available, we highly, highly recommend making it mandatory as part of your organization's security policy, not just for remote, but in general. If, if MFA isn't available for an application, we have solutions that we can, we can make it available. So key questions to ask yourself, you know, how is the remote business model working? What changes, if any, are needed for vital processes to continue? Are your line of business applications available and how do they perform? You know, where are your line of business applications or your critical applications? Are they housed on-prem? Are they in the cloud? Uh, can your team securely share the data and the files they need? Are you, are you sharing files securely right now? Who do you share files with, internally and externally? If you use Office 365, what are your sharing policies? You know, these can be customized to allow appropriate sharing or restricted to allow very specific sharing scenarios, but they can also be set up to, to allow you know, undesired sharing scenarios where anybody with a link can manipulate and edit your data. So this is an area that, that should be audited and controlled carefully. Do you have encryption mechanisms for sharing files? You know, if you need to send sensitive or protected information, do you have that ability? Are your workers set up to use collaboration tools to increase productivity? You know, what tools are you using for collaboration? Do you use many or a bunch of different ones or are you standardized on one platform? So at Data Branch, we're using Microsoft Teams for collaboration and video conferencing and we've standardized and we highly recommend it. Do your users have webcams at home and in the office? You know, I guess the, the last thing I'll say about collaboration is that staying visual and staying present it's very important for a dispersed workforce where you've got some people in the office, some people at home, and people who are transitioning between both. Thanks, Mike. Multi-factor authentication is definitely something that takes that little bit of second, but it has a pretty big impact. So our second question that we're going to be looking at this morning is, in general, how will our businesses reopen gradually and ramp up over time? And that's gonna start with our physical offices. You know, practicing social distancing is still going to be of utmost importance even when we return to our offices. So we have to be prepared to make changes to our floor plans, our conference rooms, and our signage to ensure that our teams can abide by social distancing guidelines. You know, I saw a recent CBS News poll that showed about only about 44% of workers are currently comfortable going to a workplace outside of their own home. So that means that more than half of all employees are still lacking that confidence to return to their offices or work sites. So our overall goal as leaders in our organization needs to revolve around creating an environment that's safe for all of our employees 
and communicating effectively with them what we've done to make those environments safe. And it starts with just doing a thorough cleaning of your workplace and then make sure you're communicating that to your employees so that they know those steps you've taken to ensure their safety. Don't just assume that they're going to know that you did that cleaning. You know, many of us share our workplace with other businesses. So we'd recommend that when you're developing your plan to come back to the office, that you're engaging in those other businesses you share space with, and that you're having one conversation and striving to all be on the same page with the measures that you're taking. For those employees who do come in, we need to make sure that their workspace still allows them to be socially distant from others. And if that's not possible in your current space, we'll need to consider still adjusting schedules. And conference room usage will also need limited if your space doesn't allow for proper social distancing. We also as leaders have to lead by example and make sure that our office is well equipped with enough hand sanitizer, masks, gloves, so that our employees can be as comfortable as possible and that make sure that we're encouraging good health behavior. And if we can't source these items, then we probably have to look at not reopening our offices until we have those available. Many of us have gone to grocery stores during this crisis and have seen how they've adjusted through signs at the registers marking six feet and laying down of arrows on the floor to direct the best paths for people to take so that they can stay apart. And this might be something you consider setting up in your office to ensure that your employees don't accidentally bump into others and help them enable that social distancing. You know, when we're back in our offices, there's usually a lot of group meetings. So you have to look at what your guidelines are going to be for those, especially if you're typically meeting in a more enclosed space like a conference room or a common area in your office. You might want to consider labeling those spaces with occupancy limits. Amanda, we lost your audio there. Uh oh. This is David. I'm. Uh, can you guys hear me now? I can hear you, David. Yeah, I'm in a different spot, a different location. Uh, hopefully, they realize that they <laughs> they've disconnected. Um, I guess I'll try to keep the the ball rolling here until they they get back on. Um, so I think uh, Amanda was talking about uh, uh, social distancing, and uh, you know, obviously. Um, you know that's a, a real critical thing, and, and again, uh, communicating to your team what the uh, kind of what the plan is to uh, uh, you know for coming back. And it's one of the things that we've been working with uh, internally, and, and be happy to share with uh, with anyone is a, a plan that we have come up with. It's you know it's not that it's rocket science; it's just a matter of of trying to put down you know, the, the different uh, policies uh, and procedures so that you're, you know, it, that really that everyone knows that you've got a plan to go ahead. Um, Emily, do you want to go to, can you go to the next slide? Certainly. Let's see if we can take back control <laughs> since I don't have it. Ah, here we go. Um, so just bear with me here for one moment. Well, I'd say one thing that uh, we've all learned throughout this is uh, adaptability is, uh, is really important. And this is, I guess, a small example of this. You know, here's our, our presentation. We're in front of our, our group. And uh, you know, the one person who was not going to be presenting has to pick up the ball, but you know that's okay, right? Um, so hey, uh, yes, are you back, Mike? We're back. Yeah, we didn't know we didn't. Internet was out this morning, so maybe it happened again briefly. Okay, 
Yeah, uh, one of our uh, uh, attendees had mentioned that you've been cutting in and out, so it's not like you've had an internet problem. Um, but uh, if you want to take it over from here, go ahead. Okay. Yep. You know, I apologize, everyone. I'll try to monitor the chat um, more actively while I'm talking to make sure that. On was the what new business processes have to be put in place. And, you know, I like to look at that as, you know, what did we learn during our time remote that we can implement now that we're back in the office? You know, at Data Branch, we've gotten very good at this video communication and collaboration during our time apart. And we plan to implement that into our processes when we do return to the office, potentially more video meetings with clients. And our sales teams also had the opportunity to improve our documentation process. And again, we're going to be transitioning that, that with us back to the office when we return. You know, the next question is what changes in operations and technology need to ramp up as quickly as possible? So we just encourage you to, you know, look at your business's core competencies and make sure an appropriate level of focus and energy is being geared toward ramping those areas back up as quickly as possible as a first step. And then what do we need to be communicating to our clients and customers? You know, we'd encourage you to, just like with your employees, maintain an open line of communication with your clients. You know, make sure they know who or where they can go to get questions for any questions, comments, or concerns as we move forward. You know, if you have new hours, make sure you're sharing that. If there's new visiting rules, make sure those are getting communicated effectively. You know, and it's also a great opportunity to survey our clients. You know, once things get back to a new normal, we can learn what worked and what didn't, and we can use the lessons that we've learned during this crisis to update our planning and response process with our clients moving forward. You know, and as always, we want to document what we learned in preparation for a future crisis if something like this may happen again. So moving forward, looking at our business technology and how we're going to manage it differently. Having a cybersecurity focus is really going to be critical when we're returning to work. Because while we were all banding together, cyber criminals were ramping up to take advantage of that confusion and uncertainty created by COVID-19. You know, if you look at this chart here, there was a 30,000% increase in phishing, websites, and malware targeting remote users from January to March. And Part of that is because cyber criminals were already set up to work remotely. They could just go and start pushing out their phishing emails and their different hacking methods. And essential businesses have also seen a 37% increase in ransomware attacks during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is on top of the overall rise of cyber crime and the 67% increase that the industry's been seeing in security attacks over the past six years. You know, they're not slowing down, so as organizations, we need to take precautions to protect our businesses. And the top way cyber criminals have been targeting users during this pandemic is through coronavirus-themed phishing attacks and hacking campaigns. You know, if you look at this chart um, from Barracuda, the number of coronavirus-related phishing attacks from March, from the beginning of March to the end of March is just drastic. You know, we recommend traditional security layers like firewalls, endpoint protection, but it's got to go further than that because 92% of data breaches are caused by human error and things like clicking on links in a phishing email. So educating your users is going to be key moving forward. So we wanted to just go over a few of our top tips for recognizing phishing emails. You know, you want to start with reviewing the grammar, punctuation, and spelling in the email. You know, many phishing emails are written quickly so that they can be deployed quickly. And cyber criminals often take the strategy of sending out their messages to large email lists in the hopes that they'll be able to take advantage of users who haven't been educated, or who are so busy that day that they get fooled because they don't take the time to review the full email. 
You know, many cyber attackers are also located in countries where English is not their first language. And this can be obvious when you read the body of the message. You know, the second thing you want to look at is, is this email, the design and overall quality, what I would expect from the person who's sending it? You know, we all have regular communication with our top clients, vendors, business partners, and in general, we know what a typical email from them looks like. So if you get an email from someone you communicate with regularly and it's suddenly missing that signature that's always there or just doesn't sound like them, you want to take a closer look at that. You know, is it addressed to you personally by name or is it a more generic greeting like friend or colleague? You know, this can be a sign that the person sending the email doesn't actually know you because they will push out their message to everyone they have access to in hopes that just one or two will fall for it so that they can receive their payday. The average ransomware demand is around $84,000, so they really only need to catch a few, which is why you often see these generic messages. You know, the next thing to look at is does it contain a threat that's asking you to act urgently? You know, a reputable organization or government or agency won't suddenly start threatening you via email. So you should reach out to the company and confirm if there's any action needed before responding to them. And then your bank or other official companies would never ask you to supply personal information from an email. And that's information like your password, your credit card number, your social security number, or the answer to a security question. If you do get an email asking you to provide those, we'd always recommend you know, picking up the phone and supplying it that way, calling a number that you already know. A few other tips, always recommend you know, hovering over links and emails to make sure that it's going where you expect it to go or that it's a recognizable website. And then never just trust the name listed right after the from. Make sure you're looking at the actual email address and if the email hasn't been spoofed. And then finally, your last line of defense, if it just doesn't look right, listen to your gut and reach out to the sender through another medium. Thanks, Amanda. Um, <laughs> As Amanda, as Amanda, you know, just showed us, cybercrime and cyber criminals are on the rise, and they've been on the rise. But with COVID, it's it's even, you know, it's 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 accelerated. So a couple slides back, we saw the the spear phishing um, rise, which if anyone doesn't know what a spear phishing is, a spear phishing attack is a purpose built, aimed phishing email to a specific person. It's not just a random send it out to a bunch of people. A spear phishing is when they try to target and identify somebody, um, you know, with the, the, the hopes of exposing them. Oftentimes they're posing as another coworker who's been compromised. So with the work from home, obviously we see where that's a problem. It's harder to know if a coworker is, is the one who actually sent you an email if, if they're working at home. So they, they're trying to, you know, act on that. So how do we combat that? You know, we at Data Branch recommend a layered security approach. <clears throat> so what is that and why would we use it? You know, it's just like running a race with, uh, with hurdles in front of you. We want to put as many obstacles in front of the attack or the attackers to make it harder to complete. Hopefully you'll get tired and, and, and you know, your, your mission will be unsuccessful. We layer security controls all the way up the stack, you know, to try to protect all aspects of the environment from the computer, the compute devices, to the users themselves, which is very important, to the network edge and then out to the cloud. So in the slide here, you can see the three layers, foundation security, advanced security, and then compliance and incident response. Within each of these are individual layers that are purpose-built to achieve specific goals while also seamlessly integrating with the stack as a whole. So foundation security, we've got our, this is our first layer, um, you know, and we can see all the individual components that make that up. And when we were going over this slide in preparation, you know, I went item by item and I talked technically about the importance of patching software and keeping it up to date and zero day malware, you know, lateral network security and so on and so forth. And after about 10 minutes, you know, I could see Amanda's eyes glazing over and I said, 
and I, I really need to spare everybody from that. So um, while I'm happy to have that technical discussion offline for whoever's interested, I'm going to try to instead summarize the slide by saying that you know, foundation security is designed to greatly reduce your organization's risk and improve your cybersecurity posture. It's our recommended minimum standard for any organization. And then the, the, the next layer in our stack is, is what we call advanced security. So with the current state of cybersecurity, it's, you know, advanced security is quickly becoming the new minimum standard. These are all items that we need to, to have for our, for our organizations and our workforces. These items show our employees, clients, and business partners our continued commitment to cybersecurity and our cybersecurity posture. So we've got third-party risk assessments that help us understand any gaps in technology and ensure that we remain compliant with regulations such as the New York State Shield Act, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, dark web monitoring to help us ensure that none of our accounts or credentials are currently available. And if they become available on the dark web, we get alerted to it. You know, many, many of our credentials are compromised unknowingly through other sites where we either share a password or we use an integrated sign-in and then that site is compromised. So if something like that happens, dark web monitoring is there to alert us so that we can proactively change out our passwords and make sure that you know, nobody has a foothold into our system. Um, <laughs> continuous end user security training and then simulated phishing attempts keep our users current on threat techniques and help us identify who would need further training. Um, you know, we could share lots of stories about compromises that could have been avoided if somebody had had, had those tips Amanda shared or that were trained and were able to spot and identify the signs of a phishing email or a spear phishing campaign. Um, we can also share a lot of success stories where users successfully were able to use those trainings to spot the, the phishing campaign and then act accordingly. And then, you know, using that to avoid all the negative outcomes that could have come along with the compromise being, you know, either financial or uh, business identity. Um, going down, we've got password management systems. You know, they help us keep our credentials secure and let us share them and, and know who's accessing them. Uh, email encryption for sending sensitive information, written security policies, penetration testing, um, and then finally advanced network monitoring. You know, this gives us the ability to know what's on our network, where it's on our network, detect different configurations, and analyze performance metrics to make sure that the network is not just secure, but it's performing well and it's available to our users no matter where they're located. <clears throat> and then the final layer is compliance and incident response. So making sure we stay compliant and having an incident response ready if the time comes is a vital component. So on the left, we see the New York State Shield Act emblem. Um, this is one, an example of making sure that we stay compliant with different regulations. Uh, the New York State Shield Act, if anybody was wondering, this stands for Stop Hacks and Improve Electronic Data Security. It's not from the Avengers. <laughs> so signed it, it was signed into law last year and it became effective March of this year. You know, the law covers employers, individuals, and organizations regardless of size or location which collect private information on New York State residents. The law broadly requires that any person or business that owns or licenses computerized data, which includes private information of a New York State resident shall develop, implement, and maintain reasonable safeguards to protect the security, confidentiality, and integrity of the private information. So if there's any, any healthcare professionals or anyone familiar with the healthcare um, uh, vertical, and if you've even been to a, a hospital recently, there's HIPAA forms that you've probably signed. So um, the New York State Shield Act is kind of like HIPAA for for, for non-medical information. HIPAA came around back in uh, like 1996, and then they they added on to it in 2009, so that um, employers, healthcare organizations, providers were all responsible for that electronic data that they had. So the SHIELD Act is, is similar to that, but just not for uh, healthcare information. It's for any information collected on a New York State resident, any private information. Um, and then on the right side, we've got the, the NIST cybersecurity framework, which ties into everything we've been talking about, you know, protect, detect, respond, recover, and identify. The, the prior layers were built on, on four of those, protecting, detecting, recovering, and identifying. 
the respond portion is determined by our incident response plan. So, you know, do you have an incident response plan for your organization if you had a cyber incident? Have your employees been trained on it and do they know their role in that response? And then finally, how will implementing the response plan be managed and maintained? So, uh, in summary, I guess, having these layers and different controls in place puts your organization in a strong position to support and secure your devices and employees regardless of where they're physically located, whether they're at a work from home or in the office or people who move between both. This puts us in a position to have everyone covered and feel good about our security posture. Yeah, thanks Mike. You know, for sharing about the different levels of security we should be striving for. You know, as we know, we have to continue to evaluate and elevate our level of security and that what was good enough even a couple years ago is no longer the case. You know, the second biggest thing following security when we're reviewing our business technology and preparing for re-entry is making sure our collaboration and how we're going to do that is in place. And I love the chart on the right because it really puts into perspective how quickly we all had to jump into using platforms like Zoom and Microsoft Teams over that three week period in March, where you can see the number of minutes spent in Teams meetings jumped from 560 million to 2.7 billion. And we know it's likely that video and remote communication are going to continue to be favored over in-person gatherings throughout the summer. So you need to look and make sure that your organization is prepared for that. You know, what tools are you going to use to stay connected while maintaining that social distancing? Is it going to be Teams, which is included in many Office 365 subscriptions? Are you going to continue to use Zoom? Do you have those webcams to enable video communication? How will your team collaborate on documents and share files? And are you going to be doing that in a secure manner? And then what role will video play? You know, some organizations have continued to stick with audio methods. Um, one thing that tur turning on your video can actually help your employees do is to help them stay focused like they would if they were in an in-person meeting. You know, when you're only on audio or you can't be seen, sometimes it's easy to get into your email and start doing other things. But if you've got that video on, you know, people will be more likely to, you know, have your attention. You know, and we've helped many of our clients implement these collaboration tools so that they can keep working within these new circumstances. You know, and we'd love to help anyone on this call as well. Do you want to wrap this up, David? Yes, I'm back, <clears throat> and I was paying attention to everything you said. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you, guys. Um, so, I think uh, obviously, you know, this is a a, a huge, a huge topic, uh, you know, and, and we tried to come up with, uh, you know, key points that you know from our experience and our learning, um, and uh, one of the things that uh, we'd like to offer. Uh, every attendee is a up to two hour consultation via Teams uh, to review your organization's reentry strategy, uh, and it's, that's really just a uh, you know an intent to uh, you know have a discussion about some of the things that were brought up here and see if we can help uh, to uh, to um, to help you. And you know, quite frankly, uh, some of the, the best learning that, that we ever get is from from working with our clients um, and uh, helping helping them uh, helps helps us and helps other people as well. Uh, so if you'd like to do that, uh, please reach out to Amanda. Her email is on the slide, uh, and uh, or you can call her at uh, Data Branch. Um, and uh, um, then also, uh, if you visit our website, we have a a uh, a page we've created there, and we have a, a document that would be uh, free for download uh, called Return to the Office After COVID-19. It's a checklist that uh, you might find useful as well. And uh, with that, uh, we've got a couple of questions that I'd like to uh, uh, see if we can answer. And uh, please, uh, if you have more questions, uh, put them in the chat. Uh, the first question is from Christopher, and he asked, uh, we use Google for nonprofit and can enable, can enable MFA, 
multi-factor authentication. However, the code would go to our personal cell phones. Is that recommended? Mike or Amanda, can you answer that? Um, yeah, absolutely. So I would say absolutely it is recommended. Any 2FA is better than no 2FA. Um, obviously, a better scenario would be to have company-owned or company-managed devices with an MDM, but um, I would absolutely, if your uh, employees are willing to use their personal cell phones, we've had challenges with that, but um, if they are willing, I would absolutely use it, and I would use uh, an authenticator app like uh, Google Auth or Microsoft Auth as opposed to using the text-based, you know, get a code to a, a phone number because that phone number might leave. So using the Authenticator app is, is, is a better option, but absolutely. Uh, Mike, you mentioned uh, MDM, what is that? Yeah, sorry if I'm using too many acronyms. Uh, MDM is a mobile device management uh, platform, so you can control cell phones and devices. Uh, even if they're not owned by the company, you could have people sign up and make enroll in your MDM so that you had some some controls over that cell phone and you could wipe devices and make sure that, you know, protected company data stayed there. But for just a, a 2FA code, um, absolutely, I would recommend using um, any device you can. Very good. Thank you. Um, and uh, a question from Melanie. Uh, what is the source for the cybersecurity tips that uh, we shared? Yeah, so I'll, I can jump in on that. Um, as we were putting together the tips for this presentation, you know, first we started off with, you know, just the experiences we see every day, you know, working with, you know, businesses in our communities. You know, at Data Branch, we also always try to stay up to date on, you know, the latest reports that are coming out in the industry. And we belong to, you know, a bunch of peer groups where we, you know, share share experiences and share statistics. Um, I know some of the slides there came from, you know, vendors who are, you know, in this in this um, industry that are doing their own research, you know, like Barracuda did the research on the coronavirus um, themed phishing attempts. So we really did pull it from a variety of sources and just being in this world every day, you know, what we've seen. Thank you. And yes, I mean, uh... You know, like, uh, again, uh, there's an awful lot of information out there. Um, we tried to share the things that, uh, um, you know, we've seen uh, and, and frankly, uh, you know, experienced or helped clients with as well. And I think the security landscape has changed so much where a few years ago, you would read about this stuff and say, oh, that's really interesting. And now, unfortunately, we've, uh, you know, we've had to live it more. And uh, the good news is, and you know, we when we receive a a call or an email from a client that says, "Hey, I got this email. Uh, it seems suspicious." Uh, you know, we love that. We'd rather have people ask than than click and find out later. Uh, another uh, a question here um, from uh, the Shimon Chamber. Uh, thank you. Uh, is uh, are there specific tools Data Branch would recommend for productivity? while working remotely. So, Micro Amanda? You want to take that one? Sure. Yeah, you know, I would say we would start with, you know, we're big Microsoft partners here at Data Branch. So, what we've been using internally here is the Microsoft Office 365 platform. You know, we got set up on Teams, which helps us all collaborate while we've been remotely through video chat, through regular chat. It's an easy way to share files, schedule appointments, things like that. You know, we also utilize, you know, the SharePoint and OneDrive for file sharing securely. Um, you know, I know Mike can tell you a little bit more about, you know, how to set up your sharing policies to make sure that the right people are sharing things, but that's definitely one way to remain productive and a way to collaborate on documents at the same time as well, so that you're not trying to schedule terms with them. Yeah, I think yeah. that's the biggest suite that we've used for productivity, but obviously, you know, someone on this call is using the Google suite, you know, we work with clients that utilize that as well. They can do, you know, some of those similar functions. Yeah, especially, um, I think that's exactly right. If, if you're an already an Office 365 uh, user for Exchange Online or, or, or any of the subscriptions, or you're thinking about transitioning to Office 365, 
you know, it's it, the built-in integration and components that also come along with that. A lot of people maybe didn't realize or don't know they have access to OneDrive and SharePoint and Microsoft Teams and all of the things that come with those programs. So, um, you know, if you have it, fully leveraging it is, is fantastic. Um, and then, you know, if you don't have it or are thinking about it, you know, we highly recommend the, the, the M365 platforms. Mm -hmm. And then also, if you can set up your remote workers with, you know, a secure VPN so that they can access, you know, their files and applications as they would at the office. We would recommend that as well for productivity. Yeah, very good. I think, uh, you know, one of the things that we found through this is how much, uh, you know, our experience and expertise, even though we're, uh, you know, in the IT business has improved with collaboration tools. And it's nothing like a necessity <laughs> Uh, to you know, cause you to have to uh, to want to really you know dig in and use things, and I think it's one of the things we found with Office 365 and Microsoft. There's a fantastic amount of uh, stuff besides just email behind Office 365, and uh, they, you know Microsoft keeps coming out with new new things all the all the time that uh, are designed to uh, you know really improve collaborative uh, collaboration and uh, and productivity. Um, and and there's third party things, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, tools for helping schedule appointments like uh, not there's one I've heard of called Calendly, and there's there's many other ones like that uh, to help people uh, you know work more effectively remotely uh, from from a scheduling standpoint. So that kind of stuff is is uh, is great. Um, one more question, uh, uh, you you mentioned. Uh, like uh, um, SharePoint and OneDrive. Um, and the one question that uh, would come out of that is, how can you check uh, what my current sharing policies are? You know, for those people who may be using OneDrive or sharing, you, know, you mentioned that there's a way to, to check easily to know that you're sharing your information with the right people and not, you know, not too many. Yeah, no, absolutely, that's a great question. and, and I think it's often overlooked by a lot of people. So anybody who's using Office 365 um, has a, what's called a tenant space. And then within that, and there's uh, administrators of that. So a global administrator could log in to the admin center of Office 365 tenant space and specifically go to sharing the sharing sections and um, uh, OneDrive and SharePoint are uh, a collaborative sharing settings. So you can set up, a, a, you know, very granular policies that you can share only with internal people in your domain or in your organization or specific external do domains. Or you can have it set up that anybody with a link to a file can do whatever they want to that file, which, you know, those are the things we would want to look out for and make sure if that's set, there's a very good reason for it and, you know, it's monitored and controlled. So, you know, knowing where that is and what options are available to you are, are you know, not just important, but we need to be aware of them. So they can also be uh, granular. So that's at a global level. Different sites, different teams, different channels can have, you know, individually set policies. So it, it, it can be a one, you know, one size fit, fits all, but there could be content that you want shared with just uh, the whole world. And you can publish that and make it available. But you want to make sure that it's done in the correct way. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Katrina asked a great question. Uh, do you have a resource for training on using Teams? And the, and the follow-up on that is, could this be a future training or uh, perhaps a webinar, I, I would assume? So, uh, Mike or Amanda, can you ask uh, answer that about resource for getting better at using Teams? Yep. Um, we have, there's actually some great resources that Microsoft has put together regarding using Teams that I can definitely make sure to send you after this call, Katrina. And, you know, that's a great idea. I'd love to do a future training on Teams. So, you know, look out for that. I know Mike's been training a lot of our, a lot of our clients on using Teams. So he's gotten pretty good at that. And yeah, we'll definitely keep that in mind as something for the future. All right. Um, well, uh, one more question uh, uh, that uh, we had is um, you talked a lot about uh, phishing emails. Um, do you have any recommendations on uh, training 
uh, people to get better. So, you know, I, I like to say that, uh, you know, that the, the people we on the, our fingers on the keyboards or hand on the, on the mouse are the last link, you know, mm -hmm. in, in cybersecurity and the most important link. So how do you get uh, that uh, better? What do you recommend? Yeah, we really recommend making sure that training is a continuous process. It's really no longer good enough to just do an annual training or have somebody come in and talk to your people once a year. You know, we all know that that information tends to leave relatively quickly. So the approach we like to take with security training is to start with kind of that one hour general base training to set the foundation for all of your employees. And we recommend that as just part of your training, almost like a safety training. And then also layer on to that, you know, a continuous component. So when you're looking at platforms, you know, we have one that sends out, you know, weekly videos to people with a weekly quiz to kind of keep security top of mind. And then also have a component where you're testing users and putting them in, you know, real life scenarios to see how they respond. And one of the best top ways we do this is through simulated phishing attempts. You know, emails will go out, they'll have, you know, fake links to click on. And as managers, you can see, you know, which employees have clicked on those links or fallen victim to the phishing email. And then you can also focus in on, you know, who might need more training. You know, there's really no better way to practice than to experience it. And to do that in a safe manner is something we recommend as well. Yeah, I'll, I'd like to follow up just a little on that. That's, that's a fantastic Continuous, our users are, I don't want to say the weak link, but, you know, most compromises come from us letting the exploit or letting the bad guys in through some method, probably a phishing email or a credential, you know, compromise. It's, you know, it's not all like in the movies where, the, you know, people are literally hacking into your system. Most times they're let in. And our only defense for that is educating our users and training them on how, what, is the current landscape, what are the current techniques, and then making sure that they know what to do and what not to do when it comes to cybersecurity. Yeah. <laughs> it's a journey. It's a journey for sure. Um, so I like to, you know, I, I always, you know, tell the team or our clients, it's, you know, it's basically it's a continuous process, just like, uh, I guess, life itself. Unfortunately, it's just something that is, is part of our current reality, just like what we're dealing now with this pandemic. So uh, with that, um, if there are no more questions, uh, we'll turn it back over to uh, Emily. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. I hope uh, information we shared was useful and uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to David, Amanda, and Mike at Data Branch for this very informative webinar. And um, thank you to the Olean Chamber of Commerce for partnering with us. And we thank everyone for joining us today. Very good. Well, thank you guys. And uh, um, I think they say uh, a friend of mine recently coined the phrase, uh, be positive and don't test positive. <laughs> Enjoy the beautiful day, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.